good morning and welcome to this uh, local chapter ina mumbai webinar and today we have the eminent speaker shri a sanat kumar i welcome him and we have other dignitaries here dr grover shri bhardwaj and shri natrajan who are from the da family and all other uh, participants from iit bombay my co-chair of the kulkarni dr archana sharma and uh, <coughs> mr bala subramanyam from npcl and many other colleagues from brc npcl and uh, shri jairaj from brc so this webinar is on a very special topic of the fueling machine development and uh, this uh, bio data i am very happy to share with you it is already announced so i will just go very briefly shri sanat kumar is from sixth batch of training school and he was a homi baba gold medalist and later on he has worked exhaustively on the fueling machine and fueling machine head development and uh, i was fortunate to be associated uh, in this fueling machine uh, design and analysis program I remember when this first indigenous efforts were made for the Narora fueling machine head. So many studies, experimental photoelastic models, then followed by strain gauging of the actual machine when which was ready. It was hydro tested in central workshop, and uh, Sri Sanat Kumar gave very good advices, guidance not only on the fueling machine but also on the design aspects. what he was looking for i hope we will uh, be able to listen from him and as such uh, for the general audience i will like to inform that this fueling machine is very very complex it involves multidisciplinary approach it has all the components of the mechanical electrical electronics robotics control system and all put together in one simple machine which is fueling machine and with this indigenous development we have the success story of the phwr program and uh, this online refueling is very important for our fueling machines and particularly this 900 plus day performance of this which is world record and has been achieved in many of the indian power plants phwr plants they have been achieved with this and additional features are that you know means this fueling machine has lot of innovative ideas that came into picture during the rehabilitation also so that is one another aspect so i think the younger colleagues particularly will get motivated how this uh, effort was put uh, by shri sanat kumar and his team members and we are uh, very excited to listen to him so welcome sir again for this webinar from ini web local chapter of mumbai and i now request you to give the presentation thank you Uh, professor kulkarni dr uh, r k singh i know him as r k singh dr archana sharma esteemed members of ina fellowship who attended this uh, lecture in, uh, in physical mode as well as those who might have joined online invites i see so many friends of mine here natrajan dr grover ardwaj bala ram mohan kamal kawadia so many so many people here so i am uh, terribly excited i only hope that uh, i don't disappoint <laughs> that is issue ladies and gentlemen i am grateful for the honor bestowed on me by inviting me to present this webinar in hybrid mode by inae mumbai chapter it will be necessary for me to compress whatever i experienced and learnt in 36 years in one e- one hour i therefore will attempt to pick and choose cover only certain facets of our efforts in evolution innovation and indigenization indeed many persons in dae this is <coughs> countless number of people and several external agencies including highly skilled precision manufacturers and consultants 
have been co-travelers with us at NPCIL and have contributed to this wonderful journey. Standard PPSX, standard PPSX, STD PPSX. Yeah. I plan to cover this lecture in two parts. Part one is really a simplified explanation of uh, PHWR, uh, assuming that not all here or not all who have joined this webinar may be familiar with PHWR. We just have a very brief one, and it's on power fuel landing system. It may be thought of as a abridged course material on PHWR FHS 101. The, in part one, I will cover briefly about the very, very briefly about uh, how we got into this PHWR business. In uh, part one, I will very briefly cover uh, how we got into the PHWR business. And then later on, why and how of on power refilling? Why do you want on power refilling for PHWR? Then we go to evolution and the innovation. What 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 triggers evolution? Why do you want to evolve? Why do you want to innovate? innovate? So I'll try to cover that. Then for those who may not be familiar with this, I'll cover the movement of the fuel through the reactor very, very simply, very easily. And finally, based on this, we can enunciate some of the rules of fuel handling. What, what we have to cover, this is important. Then that is part one. But actually, I am interested in part two because I am quite keen to explain some examples of indigenous evolution. What has triggered those evolutions? That also I would like to bring. And then manufacturing experience, some typical components. It, uh, time will not allow me to do this. And go to the next. So we start here. In 1960, around at that time, Dr. Baba and his senior colleagues negotiated a collaboration agreement with AACL Canada for their neutron efficient can do nuclear power plant to be built in India. Right from inception, Dr. Baba had insisted that the collaboration agreement should envisage progressive indigenization. Right, right in the beginning, that's what his main goal was. The collaboration agreement, apart from setting up two reactors at RAPS 1 and 2, also included training of Indian engineers. In the entire gamut of uh, a can-do power plant design. Design, manufacture, quality control, inspection, testing, commissioning, operation, everything, everything, uh, including including safety review, everything that was covered. So very fruitful aspect of that collaboration was, which I think in many of the new collaboration agreements don't have, very fruitful uh, aspect of the collaboration was, we got to know, know why. Very, very important, know why. Not only just know how. The know, know why answers was coming to us as and when we asked the questions. So it was necessary for the trainee to go and ask, why are you having this? So they were giving, they were not uh, hiding anything. They were giving complete information. So no why, that is a very, very important thing which uh, helped us to come up. No why in addition to know how. Detailed drawings, component specifications were also given by ACL. And more importantly, they said you can replicate this design in other sites. So that is how after RAP1 and RAP2, MAP1 and MAP2 came up on based on RAP1 and RAP2. So we had that. Then afterwards, something else happened that I will cover later. So since 1970s, having imbibed what is there in RAP1 and RAP2, we have further developed the can-do concept to our own PHWR. You can say clone or you can say Indian version. Uh, my friend G.R. Srinivasan is quite, call, say, call it Hindu rather than can-do. But anyway, uh, it is Indian version. So now, now we have from RAP1 and RAP2, 16 numbers we have already built and operated. Some are now not operating, but doesn't matter. 16 220 megawatt reactors are on the ground now uh, operating. Then afterwards, we have built 
two 540 megawatt reactors. Now we are building 700 megawatt reactor that is on the cusp of getting uh, <coughs> commercial operation. Uh, so that the fleet mode is there. So this will be the mainstay of uh, stage one, which was envisaged by Dr. Baba. Now, this uh, image introduces you to some extent on what on power refueling is that? What is on power refueling? Fuel handling, what is it you are doing? So you see here a Boeing uh, aircraft, tanker aircraft is mid-air refueling to fighter aircrafts. This is very, very important because this refueling in mid-air increases the mission time of the fighter aircraft. It increases not only mission time, it increases the range also. This has got a very similar parallel with our PHWRs. Our PHWR also on power refueling increases our mission time, increases our operation time. So that is very important. So now you may recollect very uh, recently, in a recent time when uh, France made uh, Rafale jets, they manufactured in France and they transported it 7,000 kilometers to India, media refueling. They never stopped anywhere else. So this is, uh, it is not possible uh, and for refueling. If media refueling is not there, it would not have been possible. This is true even for our PWS. And one more thing, government of India has uh, Government of India has released this picture. See, the is very interesting. The hose from the tanker aircraft is coming through, and then it has got a cup. They call a drop. Then the receiving aircraft has got a cone. The receiving aircraft. And if you see here, anything that is dropped from a height, you would think that the cup. It should be facing the ground. The force should be going to the, the ground. But it's not doing that. It is coming horizontal. It is as though it is gliding. The technology is there. And the uh, aircraft uh, uh, pilot is able to home on to the cup. And once that is done, only then petrol flows. So this means there is a design uh, technology involved. There is a operations technology involved. This is uh, high tech uh, stuff. This is true even for PHWS. That's what I want to say. Now, in this one, in the second one, you see a simple marathon runners are taking tea or drinks, energy drinks, as they are running. They are picking up from the table as they are running and they are drinking it without dropping a stick. So you can think of uh, Portia in Shailako. You know, you never, uh, never drop even a drop of uh, thing. So that is what is there. So it is precision skill, operating skill is important. The third one is a very common, everybody would know that you are shoveling in coal into a furnace. This is not a very big power plant, a power plant. This must be a captive power plant, thermal power boiler for a small amount. So a manually is loading uh, coal in that. But if you see carefully, at the end of that, he is closing the firebox. This is a very important thing. If you, do, you cannot leave that open. This is true even in fuel handling, even in PHWR, you have to close. Whatever you open, you have to close. Then one thing that is not shown, which is my criticism of that particular video clip, is that it is not showing that the operator is removing the ash from the firebox. You have to remove the ash from the firebox, otherwise combustion will be uh, uh, suboptimal. So in PHWR, you have to remove spent fuel bundles. That is important to, for neutron economy. So this is what I wanted to show. This last one, lady is uh, charging her car. It will take her eight hours, according to me, <laughs> to charge that car with uh, EV. But I hope that in future, in a few years time, uh, we will have technology developed in India also for cars to pick up charge as they are moving. Apparently in Germany, it is already there. In uh, autobahns, uh, their trucks are capable of collecting, uh, getting charge as they are moving in the high speed. So this is uh, reactor physics is very important for any part of nuclear engineering. But I will miss it for the present year. Time is not there too much, so I will miss these two times. Now this shows here 
what a phwr uses natural uranium fuel unlike uh, our uh, reactors at kudankulam which use enriched uranium this uses natural uranium enriched uranium if you put you can keep the reactor operating for about 18 months now because it has got a lot of enrichment but uh, natural uranium is having only a very limited supply of uranium 235 which is a fission enrichment therefore it requires loading fuel and unloading fuel at frequent intervals so you don't want the reactor power reactor to be stopped for just for the purpose of uh, fuel loading so therefore that is the reason why on power fuel handling is mandatory essentially for phwr power reactors uh, you see here uh, for those who are not familiar with the reactor this shows the cutaway view of a 220 megawatt reactor and uh, this is the brute that we are handling this is the bundle which is about 500 millimeters long in this particular case it is 19 and 220 megawatt now this inset here shows the relationship between between the bundle and the reactor the react you all of you are interested is get the bundles into the reactor bundles into the reactor eight bundles into the reactor eight bundles out of the reactor this is what we are interested that is what you are saying now here this picture is very interesting this is a, a real picture from uh, tarapur 3 and 4 real picture from tarapur 3 and 4 where the operator is loading fuel for the first time this is manual loading manual loading can be done with the initial loading at the time of uh, critical before going critical it can be done only manually you will notice that this is the reactor phase In no, other no. Word. Sure, sure. No, sorry. Yeah. No. This is the reactor phase, fine megawatt reactor phase. This is what we are calling channel. I'll come to that in a minute. That is the end fitting. So you see here the important lesson here is that a new fuel bundle can be handled manually. One bundle at a time can be handled manually with gloves. But more important, it is to be handled horizontally. You cannot start vertically putting it because uranium oxide pellets will get damaged. So you handle it and then he is loading it into the channel. He has to load one by one. In the When you are starting a reactor, you have not all of them as uh, natural uranium. You have some thorium bundles are there. So the reactor physicist will tell you which bundle has to go where. So he has to load something like total of 5096 bundles in a 500 megawatt reactor before it can be done. Then there is, at, the time, at this time, there is no criticality because there is no moderator. It is a dry channel. So this is what you are doing. This is not automatic on power refueling. This is manual refueling. This is a necessary operation for every reactor. Now, now this I don't know whether you are able to read. This green uh, portion here indicates what are the advantages of uh, on power refueling, which I have so far done. A, it increases the time uh, of operation. Uh, Doctor, uh, uh, here. He has already said five, nine, uh, 900 days. So I will come to that in a minute. Then there is one more important thing. Very often you want to reposition a bundle from here to here, from here to here, to get it within the core, to get better output from the bundle because the neutron flux inside the core is not all uniform. So you want to less burnt bundles, you want to put it in a higher bundle so that you can. So the fuel handling can uh, do it on power. And more importantly, this is Mr. Natarajan's area. You can detect failed fuel bundle. Very sometimes fuel bundles fail. If you detect failed fuel bundle, a failed fuel bundle will release spent uh, neutron uh, fission products into the coolant. So you can detect that failed fuel bundle and try to recover, remove it from the channel. Otherwise, radioactivity will come uh, keep on accumulate in the primary coolant, uh, coolant system and it will be a load, a mandrum load on the people. So these are the uh, very important um, uh, aspects of uh, uh, Now, this is, uh, having said that, I'm just trying to give you some statistics, latest statistics from uh, NPCL website. Continuous, safe, reliable operation for more than a year 
has so far been achieved 42 times, not just once or twice. It is 42 times it has been achieved. And since uh, NPCIL uh, world record, it had KG uh, Kaiga 1 had a world record for 962 days for some time. Then Canadians got very worked up. So they ran their reactor. So anyway, then KGS 3 and KGS 1 have got really already 634 days and 400. This is not the kind of uh, uh, performance we normally expect from thermal power plants because of their, uh, their other reasons. They don't have coal sometimes, etc. Et but this is a terrific uh, thing with PHWR as well. Now, take care to uh, this. I want to emphasize this performance has not come. I'm not trying to say that only on power refueling has achieved this performance. It's not like that. Along with the on power refueling, which is a major contributor, other things also have to work. A yeah, fighter aircraft which has to travel 7,000 kilometers is not only the fuel, the engine has to work also, so many other things have to work. So, it is uh, it is like the whole system has to work like a well-tuned violin or a veena or a sita. It has to be perfect. Only then it will happen. And that we have achieved so far. And we should, of course, achieve even more. That doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, okay. Next to Next week. Now, this one very simply describes the reactor for those who are not familiar with it. The reactor itself is a low pressure vessel which contains moderator. The thing is, through the reactor, like a heat exchanger, two, uh, 300, for a 220 megawatt reactor, there are 306 coolant channels going end to end, coolant channels going to end. This innermost tube is called a pressure tube. It is actually a pressure vessel. It is designed for containing high enthalpy heavy water. High enthalpy means high pressure, high temperature. Heat enthalpy. Not only that, it contains the fuel bundles also. So our job is to push fuel bundles into that core there. And if you push number of bundles, you have to take that number of bundles. Now, normal standard practice in our pressurized water reactors is that you push eight bundles and take out eight bundles. That doesn't mean only this is possible, six bundles is possible, four bundles is possible, two bundles is possible. It is possible, but that means the programs have to be specially made for it. It is really like that. We will come to taking out in a different way. So now, as far as this uh, refueling is concerned, reactor refueling is concerned, one can simply say, hey, you push eight bundles, you take away eight bundles. Very simple. Now, they're talking about this simplicity. I am reminded of a story. Uh, once, when Mr. Azaruddin was the captain of the Indian cricket team, uh, Australians came to play a series of test matches. One reporter asked him, Sir, if you want to beat these Australians, if you want to win this series, what do you have to do? Azaruddin, very, very, very characteristic, very simple way, his leg glance, every time we got him a four. Same way, very, very simply, he said, you have to bat well, you have to bowl well, you have to field well, you have to run out well, you have to run between wickets well. If you do all this, you will win. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, like that, if you push eight bundles, you can take eight bundles. Refueling is done. It is not like that. It is, uh, the devil is in the details. So, the, that is what it is. So, we have here, uh, incidentally, it is on power. That means, you cannot go anywhere near the channel when it is reactor is operating. So, you need a machine here. You need a machine here and you need a machine here. And the machine has to push here, this machine has to push. Now, Another complication, slight complication, is that the flow in each channel is not in the same direction in all the channels. It is going in one direction in one channel, alternate channel, it comes in the opposite direction. So we do fueling from the up, upstream end, new fuel at the upstream end, spent fuel at the downstream end. So this downstream end fueling machine will become the upstream end fueling machine at another time. So that means the fueling machine has to have dual role, like our cinema actors, you have dual role. It is both upstream and downstream machine, it has to operate like that. Yes, next one. We will come to that in a minute. Now, this is a uh, this is a bigger view of the channel. This is a view of the bundle, and uh, this is more details. We will not worry about it. The channel is like this here, and two machines are clamped here. The fuel bundles are right in the middle here in the core, and the channel also has got some hardware. But the the purpose for which I have put this uh, is. It is, there is a component called ceiling plug at the two ends. Really, the reason is that when you open a pressure vessel, you have to open, then you have to close it. And you cannot spill any heavy water. 
this is the thing here so uh, uh, that is the why i wanted to explain to this people normally say this fuel on power refueling is all very tough we are opening a pressure vessel every time every day two times you are opening and closing this is no good that is not true because that ceiling plug is a wonderful gem of a design by acl in that is the one that is one of the yeah, of course a candu reactor has got several several uh, very important points but this ceiling plug is uh, one of the very important uh, concepts which is fueling machine operates with the channel so this uh, integration is very beautiful and we will cover that in a minute uh, in, the, in the other channel so now we come to this in from acl you got this machine you got this machine for wrap one and wrap two why do you go about making this more why, why is it necessary why don't you go along with this this is a very often uh, a question that is asked of me why do you want to reinvent the wheel according to me wheels have to be reinvented but that doesn't matter here these changes are often mandated by changes in the layout wrap one and map one layout is not the same as narora and others because of seismic uh, criteria our way in which we deal with the loca so many other reasons so whenever layout changes your fuel handling system design also has to change this is the reason why next one now i will explain to you here this uh, this is the wrap uh, reactor in which the reactor is here the fueling machine is here like a fueling machine is a mechanical equipment so like an aircraft or a car you need a garage for uh, doing maintenance periodic maintenance things won't work you have to make it work etc etc you can't do that when it is inside the uh, vault fueling machine vault which is the radioactive so you have to bring it out that area is called service area and when you it is it, you can't go there and bring it out it has to be done from the control room so when that is done when the fueling machine is done here outside the vault there is no radiation or much less radiation and people can operate it in wrap and map this service area is in the same plane as the reactor vault as this fueling machine vault for seismic requirements in narora we had to put it downstairs below the vault the vault is here the fueling machine is here so the fueling machine has to go up it has to go up on the uh, column it has to go up on the column there is a bridge that will go on that so this is the one that has made this column design necessary which i showed in the previous slide now that once you have done that it doesn't stop there the fuel, entire fuel transfer system has to be say what is the fuel you got to get the new fuel into the fueling machine so that is a new fuel transfer system you got to spend the take the spent fuel from the machine and put it into the bay that is spent fuel transfer system all of these will get changed now this uh, these three equipment here are totally different 100% different from what is there in wrap one and wrap two or map one and map two this is totally indigenously designed in npcl and made here so this is the uh, i would even say the first of a kind in the can do world uh, it is like that now once we have done this future 220 megawatt reactors all of them are following more or less the same layout and the same uh, 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 configuration has been followed in the others so you once you do it it becomes helpful for others so that is how we are able to build so many reactors next time now i will uh, explain to you how the uh, fueling is done uh, very very briefly this is the fueling machine our entire idea is to get new fuel into this machine the machine will go up here this is a reactor this is the channels are there you push it into that the machine at the far end say we have north and south we call it north and south so we are in north the other side is south the south machine will receive the spent fuel bundle the spent fuel bundle again it has to come it has to find a way to send it to the bay so that is what we do so here bundles sent by nfc in the crates are brought into the reactor hall and manually lifted one at a time and put it in a trough this is only manual operation two bundles you will put and push it into the vessel called new fuel conveyor new fuel magazine then from there the level is reduced and it has to come to the transfer magazine and from the transfer magazine it will go to the fueling machine now this is a new thing here the transfer magazine is a eight tubes in a vertical magazine out of that it is it can take yeah, six tubes in a vertical magazine it can take eight bundles at eight 
four pairs and it has one empty tube. So when it aligns, it takes in the empty tube uh, one pair of spent fuel bundles and sends new fuel bundle in the same thing. So this is an exchange program. That is, you send the spent fuel bundle and receive new fuel bundle. Huh? Okay. So this is the uh, this is the scheme here. And then from the transfer magazine, you come down to uh, the spent fuel and then from here. This is a, a different scale. This is the uh, transfer. You put the bundles, two bundles, spent fuel bundles into your tube and uh, send it with water pressure. Like uh, you have pneumatic in France where uh, 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 post office, you will send letters to uh, compressed air from one place to the other. Similar to that, you have here uh, with water pressure, you send it to the bay. In the bay, there are equipment which will take it, put it in a trace and put it, store it for water. So this is the basic process how new fuel bundle gets into the uh, goes through the reactor and comes to the bay. So now we are in a position uh, we are in a position to derive or enunciate some principles of fuel handling. What is it? A. You have to handle two bundles at a time in automatic mode. B. You have to handle the bundle in a horizontal mode. And C. You have to only push the bundle. You can't uh, twist or you can't uh, rotate or anything. You can pull the bundle at specific uh, times for uh, off normal operations, but only one bundle. But otherwise, you have to push only two bundles. Now, the bundle, as you can imagine, is fairly fragile. So, the compressive load you can put on it is limited. So, the machine has to make sure that it doesn't put overload the bundles. So, the actually, the requirement is that two mechanical rams cannot compress like this. So, if one ram compresses, this has to be only hydraulic so that it will overhaul. So this is very important. Uh, these are uh, some of the, of course, everything is superseded by an AERB guide. Any fellow who is designing fuel handling system has to first meet the AERB guide requirements. That is uh, given. That is first thing here. Finally, the bundle has to be moved inside the reactor at a specific speed. You cannot push it too much because the new fuel bundle is got the reactivity. So it will, uh, it's not a good idea to push it very fast. So there is a speed limit, so the machine has to be designed for speed. Finally, all these things have to be done automatic mode. Uh, we'll call it automatic mode. Uh, other modes are possible, but automatic mode. So the entire thing in the previous slide, which I said, comprises of some 1100 commands. You have the, machine, the entire system has to obey 1100 commands sequentially, one after the one after the other. The control system takes care that one command is executed, it is got the correct feedback, only then the next command will be issued. So like that, it goes on a serial mode. We are having open loop control, essentially. So that is that is how it is. Next slide. So now I come to part two. Part one is over. Part two, I am coming. The top two uh, photographs is of the same machine for wrap one. This is 100% supplied by Canada. Nothing doing, nothing in this. Not even a bolt or a washer or anything is Indian in this. They wanted to do it. It's all completely Canadian. Uh, then we were sitting in uh, Bombay. I was in RED at that time. Mr. McConey was my boss. So uh, then others. We were very keen that this fueling machine should be made in India. Mr. VT Krishna, all of us were uh, very, very keen that we should be made in India because it's a prestige issue. It's a prestige thing here, which is a high, high technology. We should be made in India. Canadians were saying, if you do this, you will not be able to meet any schedule. So you uh, forget about it. We will give you for RAP2. Huh? We will give you for RAP2. The idea is they wanted to increase their content. But we took, and then ultimately we came to a, a, a wire media. They said, this is called the RAM assembly. This RAM assembly is a part of the fueling machine head. I will show you later. It is approximately one third of the entire machine. They said, you make this first, as we call it. If you make it successfully within time, we will let you do the other machines also. Balance uh, three machines are required per reactor. So remaining two and a half machines, we will allow you to make. This, you make this one here. So central workshops took this challenge and they did it. Now here, what I have what I tried to show is that this is a RAM assembly is here. I'm only talking about the mechanical components. 
it has got so many appurtenances it has got so many control elements um, directional valves pressure gauges switches you name it everything is there in that this is controls for the ram, spare ram assembly in those days 1975 india we were not making any raw material in india so all raw materials all standard components were imported and only manufacture was india so that is what we did then slowly uh, once somebody success su succeeds like central workshop succeeded then others were interested in taking up also other uh, private manufacturers so slowly we started manufacturing so central workshop manufactured more heads we were able to find more uh, contractors machine precision machinists people to do so ultimately this one which you see on the left hand side is the ninth fueling machine head for madras 2 so rap 2 rap 1 and madras nine fueling machine heads we did probably in about 10 or 12 years life used to be very difficult <laughs> we were struggling 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 uh, anyway we did that much of it because of central workshops then when we came to narora by that time we needed to redesign a very important component which will come later because of sanctions by the time 1974 onwards we had a sanction uh, thing we were not able to get many things which we were otherwise getting from america uh, essentially uh, usa but uh, we were when usa refused to supply we found alternate suppliers in europe but ultimately that also dried up so we were obliged to do everything ourselves so the narora machine this is narora now uh, all all fueling machines from narora onwards up to rajasthan 5 and 6 all uh, 16 uh, all uh, 16 machines all are this design ultimately totally this uh, design is 22 fueling machines are, are operating now in india which have been made so from 1975 to 2020 you can take it so this is the progress we have had so that is what it is now next one you see this is the 500 megawatt machine the 500 megawatt machine i think most of you will know we were working in s71 in uh, 1985 onwards and uh, at that time uh, the control regime was too much and we had some several other feedback also operational feedbacks we had so we wanted to plow all of that into the 500 megawatt machine and that is what it is so yeah, i will come to that later in a minute and subsequently i retired in 2001 but my younger colleagues have gone far far ahead compared to that and this is the 700 megawatt machine they have made so i would say that uh, now in 700 megawatts nearly indigenization of the mechanical parts is to close to 90 95% design is 100% manufacture is 100% uh, commissioning uh, testing etc are all 100% but manufacturing some components and getting some uh, control elements We, we still have to get something from there all of us are not made in india so i would say mechanically if you take the indigenization is to the extent of about 90% 85 90% so next one now we come to this i talked about ceiling plug this is the prototype ceiling plug 25 first numbers we made 1980 first number 25 plugs why it was made like that because aecl said no 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 you cannot make fueling uh, ceiling plug very high technology you cannot make it central osha anyway did not have the machines for it and they were not you see some 625 ceiling plugs are required per reactor central osha are not uh, attuned to mass production they are generally make one or two like that so and anyway some very important machines required for that were not there so we had to go to private manufacturers in this particular case it is cooper in satara so we got there they made this machines this uh, ceiling plugs we will talk about the ceiling plug design in a minute but this picture shows all the components here individually under 25 so aecl said you make this first then i will allow you to make it for rap 2 uh, we could not meet the schedule for rap 2 so yeah, i think here yeah, rap 2 the ceiling plugs all came from canada but from map or not we were obliged to make it here and we did that also yeah you go now this is the ceiling plug is a very fantastic design what do you have is this is the end fitting this is the ceiling face here in the end fitting here so this is the ceiling face there is a disc the disc come you have to compress the disc has got a 
uh, gasket. You have to push, press the disc against the stationary receiving plate. What you have, what is the criteria there? The contact pressure that you have to get should be greater than the heavy water pressure inside. This is the requirement. So how to put the ceiling plug, compress it against the ceiling face and then lock it in place because fuel emission has to go away. After installing it has to go away. So, see, a yeah, fuel handling uh, engineers, particularly at site, is dread is that the fueling machine is clamped onto the channel and it doesn't come out uh, or it is not you're not able to proceed with the operation which you call it hang up so this hang up of the fueling machine uh, is the dreadliest thing so when you when you reach that you're obliged to shut down the reactor very often you may have to cool and then go access the vault and then do the repair it is, nobody likes to do this so uh, okay so this plug uh, has to apply a force on this. This is the disc which I was telling you about. It has got a nickel gasket here, as shown here. So you have to compress the nickel gasket. So this is the body of the ceiling plug. It has got a very brilliant uh, action. If you have a disc, you apply, you need to, in order to apply a force here, they said, okay, you need so much deflection. So your disc can be compressed with the least amount of force. What they did, they applied the force in the center. Obviously in a beam, if you apply the force in a center, it has the maximum deflection for that. Then that is not enough. You apply it on the on a reaction point uh, slightly outside and then lock it. So now in this picture, I will show you that locking again. You know, in this picture, the upper part shows the plug lock with the force applied. In the lower part, shows the plug, the, the jaws, it is like a self-centering uh, jaw. The jaws are inverted because the fueling machine can bring it like that. Next slide. This one shows how the jaws operate. See here, if you push this, if you push this stem with the ram, the ram has got, uh, the ram assembly has got three coaxial rams. So using that, uh, upside down vertical whatever you want to do several complicated operations if you push this stem here spider stem yellow piece here it will go and then in order for it to uh, come out you take it out so this is just a push pull this is push pull yeah acl had a ceiling plug design in their npd and others where there was a turning was required uh, with the acme thread but uh, one of the design requirements for can do uh, ACL design was that there should be no turning requirement. So this push puller. Now this is uh, the sealed disc which I was talking about, for which uh, Dr. Singh has uh, done hell of a lot of uh, help for us. This is the uh, disc which is forged. It cannot be. It has to be forged for metallurgical reasons. It has to be upset forged. It cannot be machined from a solid bar because the uh, grain flow lines will not be correct. And then the loading is there. So the stress analysis for this is done by Dr. Singh here. And then it requires nickel plating. This nickel plating gasket is called soft nickel gasket. It is about uh, two, two and a half millimeter thickness. It is technology in itself. So that was developed ultimately. And it has got soft nickel 170 VPN or something like that. That is the kind of a thing here. So that you can see it here. That is it. This, this were all, uh, it is a, do or die operation. We had to do this. If you don't do this, you will not get a reactor kind of thing. So that is what it is. So now we go to this. Now this is an appropriate time, which I think where we can recognize people who have helped us uh, help, help the NPC here. Now this, this ceiling plug here as the entire fuel handling system itself has mostly it uses a material called precipitation hardening stainless steel 17.4 pH. It was developed by AMCO during World War II for their aircraft bombers. They developed it because it is high strength, high impact, wagara, 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 low temperature, maldictility is very high. So many other points are there in that. So when we started with RAP2, nothing doing, there was no way in which there is a, in fact, even stainless steel was not made in those days in India. So this uh, precipitation hardening stainless steel, and then later on a better variety of that called 13 HPHMO was also used. 
the 500 megawatt uses the 35 megawatt and 700 megawatts use the 13 8 phmo so these skills had to be developed this was done by midani uh, they developed de novo they on the astm uh, uh, chemical compositions they did and initially they found a lot of problems with they means along with them we also they were not meeting me impact requirements then they found out the secret the columbium plus tantalum control is required for getting the impact so they it's a kind of a, now they are uh, proprietary information for them i told don't know what is that combination but it is required so they have but it now since then since about uh, narora time all our requirements are being met by nidani nidani has done a very very terrific job now next comes this nitrating the problem with 1742 problem with in fueling machine head is that it has to work in water which means corrosion resistance is required it means stainless steel is required stainless steel cannot be hardened very much like a carbon steel you cannot do that so it has to be surface has to be uh, hardened in some way surface surface has to be treated and also a wear pair 174 ph versus 174 ph is very bad it will cease so if you are having a wear two parts of 174 ph running one on the other one of them has to be surface treated in somehow there are several methods one of them out of that nitrating is one this gas nitrating is that you take 174 ph and then uh, apply ammonia to that nitrogen goes in the problem with that is that chromium oxide layer is there in the stainless steel so first of all you have to break the chromium oxide layer then only the nitrogen will penetrate this was done by afd without afd we could not have done this the only thing was this is a high temperature operation uh, some temperature lower than uh, let's say 500 degree centigrade kind of operation it could not have been done because you are dealing with ammonia it could not have been done in normal furnaces we needed to procure inconelex furnace uh, for a thing which we got it from canada luckily they did not know that we are doing this so anyway we got it and mr tomar abel ramuthi all these people they have developed this in uh, afd once it was developed uh, and they have now transferred technology to private manufacturers because uh, ultimately mass manufacture of uh, these components is not going to be done in afd nor in central workshop it has to be done in private one of the problems we had in uh, manufacturing is that all the required machine tools were not available with one manufacturer okay so now that means for a deep on boring operation or a broaching operation or an electrolyzing operation he had to subcontract in those days manufacturers didn't see this as a profitable proposition at all in fact even central workshop didn't see it as a profitable one we used to do the subcontracting for them and give it so this is the thing that now when afd has been able to produce uh and then they did a mass uh, thing there also then there's yes sir yes sir we will now do it we can do it. you gave us the furnace so we gave them the furnace specification they bought the furnace and they set it up and it is going on very strongly in private manufacturing then this nickel plating i've already told you for the sealed disk nickel plating is to be done so sulfamide bath is required it is required to be nickel sulfamide it required to be highly pure it required to be electroplated so technical physics division started helped us in the beginning and then they were not able to meet the production requirement that we were wanting so we got uh, others to be in uh, uh, grower and we'll, we have got other people to be involved in that and they have developed it now this is now not in brc but uh, in uh, private company then electrolyzing see 174p electrolyzing is a hard chrome plating operation very very thin it is 2 micron thin electrolyzing but it has to be done in a bore also so now what happens is that uh, uh, we were trying with uh, ion plating dr dasan acharya used to be there we used to call him request him to do this it was not uh, possible so the electro plating has to be done for this there is a special salt that salt was not available in india we got that salt and now the electrolyzing is also done privately then chrome plating everybody knows uh, any any uh, wear pair requires hard chrome plating the chrome plating requirement for fuel handling is that usually when you go for chrome plating you have a copper base and on top of that you put the chrome plating so that you can do this this copper is not allowed in the thing so you have to put it on the virgin metal for this so this chrome plating of course there were other people uh, uh, capable of doing this then comes the now comes the important point forgings 
at that time when we were doing there was no forging at all nothing nobody bharat forge nobody was interested in uh, this forging business so we got earlier we got it from canada then later on we got it from europe ultimately when it came to narora narora also we imported when it came to 500 megawatts uh, not 500 700 megawatts they had to indigenize and it has been indigenized this is the biggest thing i can tell you this forgings of this you will see that forging later that the forgings have been indigenized by these people then manufacture of fmi had already talked about central workshops are the forerunners they did everything right in the beginning and once the central workshop started making other people said yes yes, yes we will also do it so we got it now then design consultancy our uh, our uh, entire process was uh, me and my colleagues we generate the conceptual design and in fact even conceptual assembly drawings and uh, fundamentally overall dimensions of wonder dimensions of individual parts and we have given it to consultants in this particular case tce for detailing you need to put tolerance every dimension has to be tolerated so they they, they established they established uh, standards for drafting standards and they have done tc of them then testing of fueling machines is the next to every fueling machine it got some 500 600 parts you put them together then they won't work so you have you cannot send it to the reactor you have to test it make sure the machine is in the right order so an rd all seven all three and all seven the facility was set up for this and the testing they were, they were doing, doing, doing all the way right? now so off late this testing, testing is being done, done in uh, since 2005 right? it is being it's done been in been uh, in uh, any npc as own laboratories okay then fsc yeah. controls yeah. of course uh, we are uh, nowhere uh, at least i am not anywhere in control business uh, rcnd and ecil they did the job initially ultimately it is now even that npcl has got the technology established so this is the uh, really scroll of uh, i think a lot of people in dae have uh, contributed to this uh, I am, uh, now this is the anatomy of the fueling machine i'm just taking very briefly anatomy of the fueling machine as designed by acl it has got the three major parts here this is part this note assembly i will miss it this is called the magazine assembly in between that is the forging that was required for it this is the ram assembly i have already talked about it so these are three parts so uh, this is the uh, ram control panel for the ram assembly i have put it here to show that it has got so many more parts here now this is the magazine housing that is you need to take fuel spent fuel bundles in the machine so you have a rotary magazine it's got 10 tubes so we will come to that in a minute if time permits we will do otherwise we will miss it now we talked about the, we talked about the ram so in this year you see this uh, wiggly wiggly black thing here that is a ball screw actually with the, you see the threads there ball screw then inside it there are two more uh, uh, telescopic channels so this ball screw is very important it is water lubricated ball screw even today water lubricated ball screw in india only one fellow is making at that time nobody was making anyway we were getting we were not able we were not able to get it from canada then we tried other people europe etc etc this is the way it works but this uh, this uh, video there is not very accurate because it is only a, a teaching video it is only an educational video it doesn't show the thing correctly at all there are errors in this but this is the company which has made balls what is the problem here if you think of a ball bearing the race is a closed race so ball can go around and round and round it will not go anywhere in a ball screw it has to go on a thread so ultimately it will fall down somewhere so you have to collect the ball that is falling down and put it back again here so that is called the return tube next one which yeah so this is the return tube that is there now you anybody knows problem for us right from wrap on this and until we were uh, testing in uh, thing also and it used to be a problem even for acl then they had changed the design when they went in for pickering and other things they douglas point at some point of them stopped then went in for uh, pickering they changed the design but we were not able to do one of the points was 
ball bearing a ball screw manufacturer says don't rotate the nut because when they're rotating the nut at high speed with regard to centrifugal forces it pushes the ball outside and it uh, uh, spoils the issue totally so our design has the ball nut rotating at 300 rpm acl have changed it to have ball nut traveling screw rotating that they have done which we have not done so far and they have also installed see two ball, load bearing balls are there you put a non load bearing ball building so the ball will not uh, jam against one another to cause friction so these are the things that they have done and germany they have even found out spacer between two balls they have done it we will be doing ultimately this ball screws we have to make it work come what may we have to make it work because there are already 44 fueling machines using this ball screw 220 megawatt and then 500 megawatt 700 megawatts are also having ball screws so we got to make it work so work development work on these ball screws will happen uh, one of my colleagues late mr mathur has actually improved earlier this ball screw used to come only every 200 channels they used to change now it has become 700 channels so that is because he has made some changes in the pickup uh, tube in such a way that it doesn't cause so much friction so it has life increased his life so it is now 700 not too bad now this you will miss this now this is the i would consider in this seminar if i were to say this is the most important innovation that we have done this is my theory here the real reason is the top, top one you see the magazine housing it is a welded uh, thing given by acl even canada did not have this equipment for the manufacture of this they went to a company called taylor force in uh, houston texas they made the force why it is 403 material which is p6 403 material they made this uh, one two three four five separate forgings and they welded it now if you have p6 material welded this is about 30 millimeters wall thickness there are two pressure weldings this is this is one pressure welding and this is the other pressure welding welding capable of standing internal pressure the others are mechanical strength is required so this 403 uh, thing you have to finish weld all of this and then you have to do post heat treatment that means the entire housing entire vessel has to be put in a furnace and then it has to be taken to 1800 degree Fahrenheit or something and quenched in oil. Then heat treated. So that means a oil bath. There's just no way we could get this in India. Just no way. Absolutely no way. I don't think even now we can get it. This one. It's a welded design. So uh, for Madras also we had a problem but we were able to import it from uh, Europe. For Narora we were obliged to redesign. Then my metallurgy guru, Mr. Balramurthy, suggested Sanat Kumar, why don't you change this welding? This avoid this welding, you make a flat head. You make a flat head, then it is possible to forge it. The person will forge it, semi die forge, and then punch it on the center. So you will get the grain flow also correctly, you will forge it. Now the problem was this kind of forging at that time, in Narora time, it was not available in India. It requires a 6,000 6, ton press, which is now available for 700 megawatts. But it was not available for us. So we got the forging. now. Point about this is that if you remove the welding, the forging is anybody can do. Anybody with the equipment. It is the welding that is the problem and the machining. So we were able to get the forging and this is what ultimately we designed it. So all this, all the, this, 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 this is a, see this weld is avoided. This joint, pressure joint is done with bolt, bolted assembly with a metallic seal finished. Everything else is only bolted. There is, we don't go with a 10 foot long pole with a welding rod near this. It, everything is done. All the parts are heated at first, finished machine and assembled. That is the way it goes. So now this has been uh, done very successfully from Narora. Narora 1 onwards to 500 megawatts to 700 megawatts. This is the design that is going. Only thing is with slight changes. Without this, Narora 1 would not have come. We would not have been able to get a fueling machine there. Anyway, that is what is. And uh, this. Uh, uh, what are these materials, sir? 403 stainless steel. Both? Yeah, all the same material. Same material, 403 stainless steel. And uh, uh, Dr. Singh was talking about pressure testing. This is the machine that we pressure tested in uh, Central Road shop. He did that. So we wanted to put strain gauges in the water. We, 
in order to present us, you have to put the, the mating component is coming here. So the, we have to put everything together and the strain gauges somebody wanted on the inner surface because it's 30 millimeter thick, you need to know what is the radial stress. So strain gauges have to be put and then uh, he has stuck the nose this way and got the uh, strain gauges working. It was a very, very interesting job in central workshop that was done. Pressure test. Once the pressure test was done, then it made, uh, met, of course, it was meeting all of that. Not only pressure test, ultimately they did Kushwaha and uh, Dr. Singh did the stress analysis, finite element analysis. It became all right. This we will miss. Now, you can see here the same housing, same design for 500 megawatts, slightly bigger dimension, but the same uh, same thing. But what is important is that these two parts are joined by a class, which is called the Greylock class. It is come made by a company called the Gray, Gray Tool Company in Houston, Texas. They were having it. And at some point of time, they said, we'll not give you this. So this needed to be indigenized. There are three such clamps needed to be indigenized. So this has been indigenized by 500, 700 megawatt people now. Uh, terrific uh, indigenization. The thing here is, 220 megawatts has got that 30 inch clamp. We have made sure that the 500 megawatt magazine housing meets the same gray lock clamp. You don't have to buy another gray lock clamp. So this, this is the thing we did. And then the magazine rotor will remove. Now we come back to this uh, thing here. 500 megawatts for lower money, we could not get ball screws for the uh, RAM. So what to do? And then uh, when we were testing, the ram, the ball screw ram was getting stuck up, stuck up, stuck up. We have uh, tested up to 12 o'clock in the night, etc., etc. Hall seven, hall three, nothing doing. So he again here is a do or die situation. So we thought, after all, a rotary motion has to be made linear motion somewhere. You have got a motor, hydraulic motor. It needed to be made linear motion somewhere. How do you do that? There are several ways. We cannot use what hydraulic cylinder because you cannot position it. You need a mechanical drive to do this. So if you have a ball screw, ball screw is not there, you use a rack and pinion. Rack and pinion if you use, first objection is that it is friction, too much friction is there, which we solved saying that if you have involute tooth working on a rack, it is pure rolling, at least theoretically, it is pure rolling. It will roll. So there is no friction because of the rack and pinion that is coming. So we put involute tooth. Then there is still uh, an amount of friction because if the at 20 degree pressure angle, when you put 20 degree pressure angle, it gives you the horizontal force which you need, but it also gives a vertical reaction. That vertical reaction will give you friction with the support of the rack. So how to do this? We said, okay. Yeah. We will put another, see very often in rolling mills you have two roll mills and then it goes. So we'll put it on that. So the vertical reaction is cancelled out. The advantage with this is that if you put two rack and provide the same, then the rack, the pinion, the motor, torque, everything can be halved, really speaking. But we made it 60% just in order. So that even if one is not there, it will still work. So the gear teeth is smaller, the shaft is smaller, the ball bearing is smaller. But the problem is that still the ram became bigger because we wanted to put this another ram, coaxial ram is there no that we wanted to put that also uh, rack and pinion so that is why the ram became that rack support became a bit bigger so this is the how it is implemented you see here this is the this is the rack support this is the pinion that is driving it is driving the uh, thing here now this is where you can call it a traveling gearbox this gearbox has got gears so that wherever the ram is that gearbox can make some gears run so that the inner rack can work on this. So ultimately, this is the, you know, very easy to tell that is what I want. But ultimately, by the time you prepare, by the time you come, this is how it is implemented. All very complicated thing. So this is how this is the cross section, this is the cross section, this is the elevation, the rack and the rack support, etc. But one thing is very important in this, <laughs> which is not there to my knowledge in any of the ACL machines is that this ball bearing assembly is modular. You can simply take it, put it and then test it somewhere else and put it back. The whole thing is modular. All ball bearing assemblies, all seal assemblies are modular. They can be removed. Okay, so now we come to ball bearings. Ball bearings, everybody knows ball bearings. 
but everybody knows only oil lubricated ball bearing water lubricated ball bearing is a problem because oil lubricated ball bearings use carbon steel they use carbon steel balls we cannot use that in here because of corrosion and stainless steel does not have enough adequate hardness so the ball bearings have to be terribly derated in order to be working so this is what we found that uh, in uh, all three they did the test we said if you want a load p to be taken by a ball bearing then you must select an oil lubricated ball bearing which is eight times p capable so it it has to be up, taken eight times so that is what it but we have different types of uh, ball bearings not all these are used in 220 but 500 megawatt uses this and the in a water lubricated bearing the raceway does not have full compliance normally in oil lubricated bearing the raceway is 50% of the radius of the ball here it is 54% because wear particles are there and they have to go through the bottom so that is the reason why ultimately we got this then we tested when we tested we got all this here we tested then we tested this what happened at least with one bearing we tested the bearing with the highest lo load rating and you can see that it uh, is failing the raceway is failing not the ball the raceway is failing why is it failing that is because the 440 c the 440 c material 440 c material was neither esr quality nor cvir not calcium it is normal quality so the carbides had precipitated along the line here and they were weak spots so we, we said no 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 now not possible so we have we now now testing either esr quality or cvir quality so that the high, any precipitate there are finely divided so that is what we are now having here so now with this we have uh, i think we have solved now at least as far as 500 megawatts is concerned this water lubricated bearing was also not indigenous now these people have indigenized that also they are making it in india this is a terrific job they have done so now this is the last two slides you after all after you take the bundles into the bay our job is to send it to the plutonium plant we have to ultimately give it for reprocessing that is our policy so a flask was designed this is 1974 in those days the bundle was kept in the bay it had a cooling of only 180 it is producing a lot of heat so even though it is out of the reactor it is producing heat so it needed to be cooled so we needed a designed a flask which will have fins and it will cool for 80 days then later on we found decontamination of this is a problem because it goes into the pool the flask there one important thing is this flask has to be compatible with the pool in the reactor as well as the pool in the reprocessing plant it has to be compatible in fact the mr ayan prasad and sita ramaya they have the one who are ultimately approved this uh, design okay it will work in their pool so uh, that is what it is then later on we redesigned it to have a smooth surface so that decontamination will be possible now comes the last slide see tarapur 3 and 4 in the last 15 months any any operator should be very proud of this output in the last 15 months it has been consistently holding 100% capacity factor now i am not saying that this capacity factor of 100% all the while it is here december 21st to january 23rd when the time i prepared the <coughs> slide the February data was not available. Now it is available. There I have put it on top. So uh, uh, I am not saying here that this is only because of on-power refueling. On-power refueling is one, but several other things also have to work properly. There are three and four at the moment. Heaven forbid, they are working very nicely. As a matter of fact, I would like to even suggest that if uh, late Mr. <laughs> Carty was here, he would should be very happy with this performance because he was the chief designer for Fender Megawatt. Everything was his. everything was his so that is what he did now uh, i am not sure i will leave this on for some time this is the end i have come to the end i will leave this slide on i would very strongly recommend that you please see these two videos to the your, uh, links that i have given if it is not there i will give it to dr singh you can take it from him later or you can uh, take your mobile camera and capture it so these two the first top video is provided is done by national geographic and it is about tarapur and i have said here from about 15 minutes to 20 minutes it talks about fuel and it talks about the entire reactor but 15 minutes to 20 minutes uh, 21 minutes it talks about the fuel handling exclusively by uh, a very very 
dear friend of mine, Mr. Uh, uh, Umang Mitar, Mitar, the late Mr. Umang Mitar. He, he actually he is the man who got this commissioned in uh, Tarapur three and four these machines. He owned the machine. This is very important. The operator has to own your design. If it doesn't do that, it won't work. So this is uh, what he owned the design, and that is how it got. And then the next one is also by ACL. They are uh, they had a ACR pro, a, a proposal for making a thousand megawatt PHWR. I think uh, they were cheating a little bit. They were trying to put some end to the name into this. <laughs> Get so anyway, this is the one. But this is a fuel handling system of that ACR. Uh, they have put this entire video is on that purpose so you can uh, see it. Our 700 megawatts does not actually completely follow this, but it has got some principles of that implemented in that okay so i come to the end of that i don't know whether we, i'm on time thank you thank you very much for the patience hey, one more is there ah, that is important so <laughs> thank you very much for your patience i hope you will not ask any questions so <laughs> anyway uh, yes sir thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so uh, thank you Vishwanath kumar ji for your illustrious lecture and it was just like you know carrying forward with your journey and i think uh, it was just like a refresher course for all of us in mechanical uh, electrical electronics and control engineering and on top of it the nuclear engineering so i thank you for your you. Uh, lecture and uh, i am sure uh, many people will have questions so few questions may be addressed by you uh, from here if i know the answer as well as if there are some questions in the chat box, I would like to see and so just see chat box if there are any questions. Yeah. Chat at the right hand bottom. No, not as yet. See the fuel handling, I will tell you. Uh, apart from that, we used to have a very illustrious uh, senior. Six years senior to me, one Mr. Jay Bargan. He was uh, trained in Canada and he used to work in uh, RAP1. And he was in charge of the fuel handling system in RAP1 and RAP2. He was uh, getting frustrated because, you know, when you commission a system, uh, nothing works. So you have to be. Then he was saying, <coughs> normally what happens is the project manager is saying, when are you going critical? When are you going critical? When is it done? He says, there's always a pressure for. Uh, schedule. So he got frustrated and said, said this fueling machine is a black box. It's a black box. That, uh, that the terminology brought in black box terminology for the fueling army. Since then, everybody has treated this fueling machine as a black box. I, I don't want to know about fueling machine. So this is a black box. So I used to tell that it is not a black box. You come to me, sit with me for half a day. I will simply explain to you everything. But uh, that was not the case because it was easier for everybody to say that it's a black box and forget about it. So, so, that, so maybe that is the black box theory is working here. So How did you take question. care of alignment of fuel machine to the channel? Yes, yes, yes. Very important. Very good, good question. Uh, if you see here, can you go back to the, can you go back to the, can you go back to the, uh, it's okay, sir. No, 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 I'll tell you. The fueling machine, I, I know I, I'll show you the slide. Uh, you know, it's okay, it's okay. Now I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. See here, you asked the question here correctly that so I will just put XYZ. That is the machine has to be one channel you have done, you have to move it to the other channel, you have to move to the other channel, up and down you have to do it. It's very easy to put XYZ, but <laughs> quite difficult to come and do it. And that is exactly what is being done by this. In the case of AECL, this is called the carriage. The machine is kept on it with gimbals, with gimbals. So, the, uh, exactly like uh, refueling in the media refueling, the fueling machine comes and you know the position of the channel within a tolerance of 10 millimeters. Actually, much, much more, much better, 10 millimeters. You know where the center line of the channel is. So, you position the fueling machine x y and z 
with the potentiometer, the LVDT is potentiometer, fine drive you have. And then you come, the error band allowed is 10 millimeters, but actually much, much better than. So then the channel end fitting and the machine have got tapers. So when you advance in the Z direction, the machine tilts. You sense the tilt and then try to correct it because it, it will tilt in Y direction or it will tilt in X direction. So you make a correction by fine Y and fine X. Ultimately, the point is you need to get the machine in line with the channel. As a matter of fact, if you see here, my drawing has not been very good. If you see, carefully see, this machine is not very well aligned with the channel there. It is, uh, sorry for that, but uh, I didn't have AutoCAD or anything else. So, uh, drawn only with uh, PowerPoint. So, it is required. So, this is done. There is a error correction system available, gimbal driven error system system is available for the machine to align. And once it aligns, it clamps. Then ceiling plug, shielding plug, all that it will do. Right. Uh, Omar, from the of, uh, now the kind of thing. Oh, sorry. I don't know too much about PFBR. But uh, they tell me that uh, PFBR refueling has to once they have a, they have got sodium first of all and uh, it's quite complex. Uh, they have to refuel up with that uh, fast reactor once in six months or eight months like that. They, they have to do that. And uh, that is because it's uh, a very heavy duty <laughs> reactor as it is. So very in a very small core you are producing 500 megawatts. So it requires that. Looks to me that as of now they are having some problem. But whatever little I have seen earlier, it is a doable uh, system. And I'm sure they will do it. In the FBTR, they had a machine and they had, it was a French thing, they had a failure of the machine and that put them off for some time. But they came over it. Anything is possible to do. Anything is possible to solve. No problem about it. I am very confident. They will solve it. Only thing is it may take time. I do not know exactly what is the problem which is causing them in the uh, fuel transfer system. They must be able to do it. So I don't have the information. Bamra is not here. He is probably looking after the machine. We are always touching the horizontal uh, part. Maybe it might be having many advantages. But uh, sagging and all. Uh, yes. Comes into so that uh, pressure tube is designed for that. As a matter of fact, pressure tube over, over that you have what are called uh, that is that that and yeah. on top of that, uh, out of that pressure tube, there's a calendar tube. Actually, tube inside tube. So all of them have got enough moment of inertia to take care of the uh, thing. But it's still calculated. The bundle is uh, limited to 500 megawatts, uh, 500, 500 millimeters. Feet. So even if there's a small, small bend, it will negotiate it. That it will. It is not necessary that it should have perfectly right because it is into like a train. You have uh, links in between two carriages. And it can take uh, some amount of up and down of option also, not only curve, but up and down also it can take. So similarly, it is here also. Sir, you were talking about the water lubricated wall bearing, oil lubricated wall bearing. But nowadays requirement are these for there is no lubricant should be allowed. Suppose you want to weld cavities in the vacuum, their ball screw should not have any lubricant. A vacuum means you cannot even have water. That's what you're saying. Is not, uh, uh, see, uh, actually, there is a material called uh, molybdenum sulfide. I am just telling off the head because you asked a question, I have to answer. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right or wrong? <laughs> there is a material called molybdenum sulfide. That molybdenum sulfide can be coated. Molybdenum sulfide is very good for uh, low friction. But ultimately, any such bearing, if you don't have lubrication, and if you have not over designed, see wear takes place because of contact stress. Okay, so if you have this ball bearing, and I don't know what is the speed with which they are doing, but if you do not have uh, ball screw length, no, speed, speed, per minute. Per, so per, per minute. Okay, anyway, uh, no, what is the ball nut? That ball nut that is rotating, no? What is the speed of that? That is that is what is important. Speed of that RPM is important. Now, if you put molybdenum sulfide uh, coating on that, you can reduce wear. But I would say 
that in vacuum system, if you are going to have drive like this ball bearing, ball bearing or ball screw, ball screw, ball screw. If you are having, you make it in such a way that it is easily replaceable. Panda, that is what is important. Don't put it somewhere and then say 30 years I will not touch it. That is not a good idea. Anything should be maintainable. Maintenance, you must take care of it. I think molybdenum sulfide sulfide will do. And then, yeah, I don't know how loading is there. There is something called a delrin material, ball. So if you put that, that is a phenolic material. It will not take too much load, but it will not give you friction. So you can use that. And then the other met method I told you, between two balls, you put the delrin ball. Uh, that will reduce also. So there are methods available for reducing friction. Ultimately, you have to make one and test it. Otherwise, there is no go. Uh, it is very important. You have to test it. ACL have done it. Tremendous amount of testing. The ball screw originally they had for BRAM was in fact made by a rolling process by Saginaw steering gear, which is no good. We are now grinding, which is for much better finish, much better accuracy, much better tolerance. In India, all the ball screws are right. And in other words, the ball screw is also hollow. So we I, this experience I will tell you. Uh, once we got the ball screw from Saginaw steering gear earlier, then central load shops started machining there, started putting the inside tube. You know how how machine how manufacturers are. They are always very happy to pounce on the designer. And I was the designer. <laughs> central load shop manufacturing. They said, why oh, your ball screw is all no good. Is not aged, my tube is not going. I'm not able to put the tube inside. Then we start, we thought, uh, after we got to troubleshoot, we started measuring and finding out. I was saying, you well, let us hone that uh, tube and then the errors will go away. Ultimately, what had happened is the manufacturer of the ball screw had taken a tube and then rolled the thread. So the rolled thread, when he rolled the outside of the thread, it produced a ridge on the inside, which was stopping this fellow from going. So now, I, what our people are doing, they are grinding. Grinding means you are not putting so much force on the thread machine. So our, uh, to some extent, that uh, 200 channels refueling to uh, changing to 700 channels is, is a good uh, progress. I hope it will come. Incidentally, I wanted to tell you, they forgot, the Starapur 3 and 4 fueling machines, as of today, as of yesterday, that is, have done more than Tarapur 3 and 4 put together have done more than 15,100 channels refueling on power. So each uh, reactor 7,500 channels they have done. It is uh, rack and pinion. I am told they have not changed the rack and pinion at all. See, if you take rack and pinion as an equivalent of the ball screw, they have said that they have not reached, they have not replaced the uh, rack and pinion. The reason is the rack and pinion is over designed. We, have, we did not know. What is the stress that should be at the time, 1985, when we were doing? We did not know. So we were very conservative in the design. The width of the uh, pinion is very wide. It is hardened and the speeds are low. The contact stresses are very low. We have kept it like that. And therefore, up to now, they have not changed. And one more very interesting point about that rack and pinion design is that in the whole system, the entire ramp, has to give the maximum force, which is uh, 3000 kg, maximum force at only one point. That is to operate the ceiling plug. It is only one point. Ultimately, if you see, it is only one tooth, only one tooth of the entire system that is taking that maximum load. Otherwise, it's all fair enough. Everything is uh, plain cheap. So the rack and pinion design has been made so that the individual sections can be replaced. If it becomes the one that it is, can be replaced, ground, put it, it will work. So that is the design that we have done. But see, what we have to sacrifice on account of these design changes is the machine has become very long. It has become a little bit more long, but uh, site have accepted it. So to that extent, I am thankful <laughs> because that is what it is. The rack and pinion, that is what it is. Story. Well, uh, we come to the end of the lectures and discussions. And uh, I must say this was uh, something which uh, tells us how all practical things are interdisciplinary and knowledge of all the subjects goes into a machine of this kind. And that also makes us feel that how pioneers in the Department of Atomic Energy have brought the total program to this level based on which now I think 700 megawatt uh, is uh, 
working at 60% and very soon we'll go to 100%. And we are standing on the shoulders of pioneers like Mr. Sanat Kumar. And that is why the program is uh, moving forward. Shoulders are grouping. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I Thank think you. one Thank point you uh, which uh, uh, Sanat Kumar Saab said that anything is possible. Yeah. Uh, that is something which should motivate all the youngsters to carry on the program further. And on behalf of the local chapter of uh, INAE, what would we like to make a small... Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.